And I love writing about females who maybe don't quite know how brave they are until they're put in a position where they are tested. Um, and, you know, I like writing the women who don't wait for the man to come and save them. Welcome to Book Reporter Talks 2, where our interview today is going to be with our guest, Kimberly Bell. We're going to be talking about her latest novel, My Darling Husband, which is her seventh novel of domestic suspense, seventh novel. We're going to be talking about that, too, that has lots of surprises in it. And reading this, I was literally on the edge of my seat, fearing for what happened with these people. So welcome, Kimberly. And we're going to start by you telling us about My Darling Husband. Yes, of course. And thank you for having me. So My Darling Husband is a story of a woman named Jade. She is a stay-at-home mother of two young kids. They're seven and nine, a, a boy and a girl. And her daughter is um, a violin prodigy and maybe a little too smart for her own good. Um, and she's coming home one day with the two kids on the back seat of her car and in all the chaos of getting them out of the car, does not notice the man in the corner in the shadows of the garage with a mask and a gun. And he forces his way into the home and holds her and her children basically for ransom. So all this is going on um, inside the house and on um, she calls her husband and he's racing around town trying to pull together this obscene amount of money within three hours. It's like 734000 and a whole bunch of change. And if you've ever tried to withdraw a large sum from the bank, you know that that is basically mission impossible. And he has to bring it home before 7 p.m. So. And it's it's got to be cash. It can't be a certified check. It's got to be cash. Yeah. And he's... <laughs> And it's like, okay, now where are your bank accounts and who can he talk to? It's like crazy. It's crazy. So what drew you to do home invasion as a plot? Because it's terrifying because you think how easy in some ways it is with electric garage door openers and everything for somebody to get in, sneak in with you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I live a good part of the year in Atlanta and unfortunately it's a city where you hear about these things a lot. Mm -hmm. So um, it was kind of front of mind. And then I was having a conversation with my editor at Park Row and she gave me, you know, she, we were talking about next stories and um, I kept suggesting things that they were shooting down for a whole bunch of different reasons. You know, they had stuff too similar in the pipeline or all sorts of reasons. And she said at one point, she said, what about a mother who is protecting her home and her family from danger? And as soon as she said that, the idea just kind of plopped in my head, because like I said, it happens all the time around me here in this city. And we even know some people who it's happened to, and they had also a very similar story with the very specific amount of money, which um, I took and kind of ran with for this story, because it implies yeah. that this kidnapper, the, the home invader knows something about this family that, um, and it's maybe not such a random, random home invasion. Yeah, and Jade thinks, oh, my marriage is so solid. I know everything about him. And now it's like, wait a second, what is this, why this money? So Beatrix and Baxter are not taking the situation lightly at all. Like they go into this in rescue mode. And Jane and Beatrix especially are trying to figure out how to outsmart the man who's holding them. And they're like convinced that they're gonna be able to do this. Did you write knowing that they were going to be these two brave women? Because the child is younger. The little boy is younger. He like, you know, here's my pet. Let me show you. Let me do this with you. Like he's embracing and being like chatting with the man with the mask and the gun. Right. So did that happen or did it happen along the way with the story? Did you never give me these two brave girls? <laughs> um, well, I love writing, especially for my female characters. And, you know, I typically, I, I, although I do write from the male uh, point of view um, in this story from two males points mm -hmm. of view my main character is almost always a female like my main main character and I love writing about females who maybe don't quite know how brave they are until they're put in a position where they are tested um, and you know I like writing the women who don't wait for the man to come and save them now mm -hmm. I realize that she's waiting for her husband to come home with this big sum of money but she's not just sitting there right she's mm -hmm. She's thinking about how she's going to save her children and, and what's she going to do um, it, you know, if Cam can't come or maybe before he gets there. So I do kind of 
uh, go in when I'm sit down to write a story. I go in knowing that my main characters are going to have to summon this courage that they didn't know that they had. And maybe with Beatrix, because like I said before, she's maybe a little too smart for her for her own good. I knew that her smarts was also going to get her in trouble somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and and that also really heightens the the suspense around, you know, and the and the conflict and the terror that Jade is feeling, my main character, the mother, because she's watching her daughter be really brave and do these, you know, brave slash maybe reckless things. And mm -hmm. you know, she wants her to escape, but she also doesn't want her to do something that's going to get her hurt or worse. So it's 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 a horrible, terrifying situation to be in as a mother. Um, and I definitely use that to my advantage in this particular story. Yeah. And they're, they're doing looks like back and forth, like, look at the phone. Can I do that? Can we get to the alarm? And they're both on the same wavelength. Like you just love that while he's running around with the stuffed animals or whatever, but they're sitting there trying to figure out what they're going to do. And it's how can we break out what we can do? But the house layout also enhances the stakes in the book because we all get to see this house, like where the rooms are, is that's all going to matter because he can't sit them in the living room in front of the big window and he actually needs the drapes closed and nobody coming in, don't answer the door. Did you sketch out the house to see how that was going to work out? I lived in that house. <laughs> I kind of modeled it. I mean, I took a little bit of, especially with the upstairs rooms, I, um, but I really modeled it as a, after a house that we lived in when my kids were little, maybe not quite that young, but um, yeah. And so the detached garage and the little covered, you know, thing to the back door and uh, the layout of the rooms downstairs, how when you're in the kitchen, nobody can see you from the street. But as soon as you step out of the kitchen, it's like a straight shot up the hill through the windows um, for the neighbors to look in. So I, I you know, it was, it made it, writing it a lot easier for mm -hmm. sure. Um, yeah. But it was a good layout too. It was really because, scary. Yeah, it was a good <laughs> layout. Like, this house, it could have happened. When they're sitting at the counter or whatever, you could actually picture it. And it's like, oh, but you can't go that much further. Or people could see you. Okay. So I've got it. So writing the kids in peril is really tough though. And those parts are really difficult, aren't they? Because like, do you have to get up every once in a while and go, ooh, it didn't really happen. <laughs> You know, it's funny when I'm actually writing the story, I don't get that um, viscerally, you know, emotional about what's actually happening. When I'm coming up with the outline, because I, I do write a very, well, I don't know about very detailed, but a fairly detailed outline. My outline is usually somewhere around 15 to 20 pages and it's mm -hmm. chapter by chapter what happens. And when I'm thinking through that part of it, that's when I get like really nervous and oh my gosh, this is scary. But when I'm writing it, you know, I'm, I'm doing so much choreography and thinking about, you know, dialogue and, and things that are happening. It's much more technical, I guess, that mm -hmm. I don't really get that super, super close to it. Um, but yeah, I can scare myself when I'm outlining for sure. Or when I'm coming up with, you know, a, a plot in general. Um, sometimes it's... Okay. What I are think we doing? <laughs> when you, when you scare yourself as the author, that's when you know it's going to scare the readers too, right? Right. Well, probably when you're writing later, you, you've gotten a page 20 of your outline. So you know what's going to happen. So you're like, okay, now I'm just going to bang it out, which makes it a little bit different than when you're writing the stake up here. You yeah, know, it's true. Yeah. By the time I actually sit down to write, I know exactly how the story's going to end. Mm -hmm. So that does definitely does keep me a little from, freaking out while I'm writing it. <laughs> <laughs> Would have to. So Beatrix had to be fun to write. Like, you know, just like, and did you actually have notes about what her character was going to be in your outline or did you just keep dreaming her up as you were writing? Um, I'm not sure I had the violin part in there. I had her as a gifted, you know, a gifted, really smart um, nine-year-old, um, maybe a little precocious, maybe a little stubborn, um, you know, I had all those parts of her character in there. I think the violin thing was something that I came up with a little bit later. And then once I started researching these kids with this kind of talent, you know, I mean, they're really brilliant. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I definitely ran with that as I was writing it. But she was she was always in my outline as someone who was a little um, brilliant. <laughs> 
Well, I love when Jade's watching her and calculating how much therapy it's going to take to get her over this <laughs> at that point. And I just, just, it's just like this perfect line of, I just know how much therapy she's going to need later on to get over this. And you're just sitting there going, well, we're going to get out of this situation, but there are going to be ramifications. And right. I don't think we're going to really have to worry about him, but her, oh, it's going to be an issue. It, Baxter is fascinated by this man in a mask because Batman wears a mask and, right. you know, um, so yeah. Yeah. He, he's just, there, like, oh, it must be this, like, I'm in, I'm in a show now. It's like yeah. a show is now happening at our house, exactly. you know, blah, blah, blah. Exactly. So both Jade and Cam tell their stories in the first person, which makes it very effective because it's really what they're thinking. It's not what's being interpreted for them. Was that always going to be the voice for them? Is, is it, you know, bam, we're just going to tell it out. Yeah. I, I actually really love writing in first person, present tense. That's the way my characters come out almost always. I can't remember. Was Sebastian in third person? I don't I think that either. I don't, I just don't remember Sebastian, the kidnapper. Um, yeah. So I, I just, I, that's my natural way of writing and I've, I've written some in third person, but it's just for me, I like being in their head, mm -hmm. especially when you've got like this high conflict tension kind of story. Um, I just think it works really well for this kind of story and it, and it, and it, it feels natural in my head to write from first yeah. person. Well, I like that she makes the call to him. She calls Cam and she knows he always answers her calls. And boy, yeah. in my house, that would just not happen. I mean, it would just like, oh, did, did you really call? Like, did you really need something? I'm like, yeah, that's the reason I called, you know? Exactly. So that needed to work. Like he had to have that reason that he picked up. But talk about the backstory, which is the reason that he always picks up the phone. And it says something about the marriage as well, that of where she sees herself and where he sees himself. Yes. So she calls him and she knows he's going to pick up because they've had an instance before where she called him um, on the way to the hospital with one of her children and a broken bone, I believe. And that's actually something that has happened to me in my marriage with my husband and children, exact same thing. So I guess you can say I put a little bit of myself in this book <laughs> besides the house. Um, but yeah, so he, he, you know, now the agreement is when she calls, he picks up. Right. And he picks up and says, um, wait, can I have 30 minutes? And she's like, no, you don't even get 30 seconds. You're not getting anything. You know, exactly. Exactly. So this huge sum of money that the home invader is, lo is looking for. And the exact sum, I like this, is $734,296 um, no, $734, is what he wants. And Jade really thinks Cam can pay this. Like in yeah. her brain, he's just going to go to the bank and take out this money and be home. And I think it's like, you know, six hours or something like that. He's got to get this done. And we start to see then that there are secrets in this marriage. Like she thinks he's very well off and she thinks all these things are going well. It's this real look. Were you giving us a little perception reality kind of moment going on here of what's really going on with this couple? Yeah. So, and you know, that's the reason. So Cam is a celebrity chef in Atlanta. He has a number of steakhouses. He's, you know, um, kind of, kind of a local celebrity. And so when I was thinking about, you know, what, how I was going to make Cam, what kind of person he was going to be, I knew I wanted to give him a very visible role and a very, um, you know, a little the one that carried some status so that not just the kidnapper, but also Jade and everybody else in town will think that he's a guy with money, right? He owns all these steakhouses. He keeps opening one after the next. He has these big fancy investors who come in and, you know, throw cash around. And um, yeah, so I, I, he has the, this perception mm -hmm. of being a very wealthy man um, in the restaurant business. Well, not so much anymore. And I think I use this as a plot point in my book too. You know, now it's, it's gone to um, uh, credit cards and, mm -hmm. you know, plastic only, but it used to be a very cash heavy business as well. Um, so, you know, that just seems like he would have a lot of money just lying around in safes or wherever in bank accounts. But um, anybody who's ever owned a restaurant knows, especially when you're expanding quickly, like he was or is, um, you know, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble that way too. So, um, yeah. So, you know, Cam meanwhile is running around town trying to pull together money that he doesn't really have 
And um, Jade is thinking, oh, he's just going to go to the bank and, you know, he'll have a couple, he'll probably have to go to a couple banks because he's got multiple, you know, bank accounts or whatever. But I mean, 734000 and what did you say? $296 is a yeah. lot of money. <laughs> I mean, you can't just like go to the bank and get that. It doesn't yeah. work that way. And he has a time frame, like clicking on top of them. There's right. a time frame of trying to get this done. But the book opens with him planning an interview to set things straight. So when you open the book, yeah. you're not into even the kidnapping. So right off, we know there was something awry. Like we right away knew this. Was that always the opening? And were those interview sections always throughout the book? Or was that something you added later to say, let me figure out how to unravel what he really did? Yeah. So I, you know, like I said, I write from an outline. So that was my straight up story plot was the outline. And I finished it and I was like, I love this, but I just wanted like just a little something more, just a little something to make it kind of pop. And that's when I came up with the interview chapters. And I wrote those like just straight through and then went back and threaded them mm -hmm. in. Because you're right, it's, it's, um, use, so right off the bat, you know that he survived, but you don't know what happened to the rest. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and it becomes clear in his chapters too that he blames himself. So you know that he did something that he regrets. Mm -hmm. um, and I like, I like the way that that played and kind of kept the chapters moving too, you know? Mm -hmm. Because it's not just the two of them talking back and forth. It's him going, let me tell you how it really is. Let me tell you what's really going on. You know, restaurants. In the last two years during the pandemic, we all learned a lot about restaurants. I mean, I had not thought about the credit card thing. I had not thought about um, cash and flow. I had not thought about buying things in bulk and getting them there and then no one showing up. Um, it just became a whole education about everything from supply chain to what really happens when you're in a restaurant. And so many people cut that back on their menus and all these kinds of things. What did you learn about being a chef like that, a celebrity chef and running a restaurant? Because right now there's so many people in that spotlight kind of a, a role and you assume everyone is wealthy and everything is okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, the restaurant business is one of those that you can get yourself in a lot of trouble if you go too fast. Um, mm -hmm. We have a, a friend who is the real Atlanta State King, Kevin Rathbun, and uh, he's doing really well. But, you know, I just know from his stories and the things that I've heard about his business that you do have to be really careful. And the investors sound great when they're throwing money at you, but, you know, investors always want to be paid back. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you run into some kind of trouble and Atlanta is a great city for restaurants, but it's very fickle. So you have to make sure to stay relevant and you can, mm -hmm. you can start really strong and then just tank. So, you know, and when I was writing this story, it was uh, March, 2020. So the, the whole pandemic restaurant mm -hmm. drama was in, you know, full swing and, um, so it just seemed like a really good choice to make Cam a, a chef and to give him all the issues that come along with, with mm -hmm. restaurants. And I actually, in my very first draft, wrote in, I used the pandemic as kind of like a plot, you know, point where, you know, he was all of a sudden struggling because his restaurants, you know, were closing and empty and all those things. <laughs> and my agent was like, too soon, too soon, take it out. <laughs> so I took it out and just made him, you know, a struggling chef who's maybe gotten a little too, too big, too fast. Yeah. 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 And you're closing a restaurant is like admitting failure. It's admitting like, and then every, every eye is on you of what ends up happening. I remember interviewed um, Danny Meyer years ago or reading about his book. And he was so proud that he had, I mean, he has all these restaurants and Shake Shack now. So yeah. he was really proud that he had never closed one of his 13 restaurants and things have changed since then. Some people have bought his restaurants. He has closed a restaurant since then, but I remember that was a point of pride yeah. that everything was still there. Did your research show you that they feel that kind of a failure? They, they, that's something that's a real, fair in a chef's and especially with a, a number of places yeah for sure and you know i mean pr is a real thing and bad pr especially if if they hear you know that one of your especially when they're all called the same thing right so mm -hmm. this and it was in here it was you know his last name lasky steakhouses and if one of them closes people are going to think that they're all in trouble you can't mm -hmm. just close down one and 
and, uh, and, and, you know, keep going with the others that people are going to make assumptions mm -hmm. about why you close. So I know this from Kevin. I also know it just from, from research. Yeah. People are really, uh, worried about, and they, and, you know, and need to be worried about, you know, their reputation in town, especially when you're a big prominent chain. Mm -hmm. Well, you're a big prominent name. And it's interesting because um, their celebrity has changed about this over the past decade. I mean, for, for years when you're growing up, when I was growing up, you didn't know who was in the restaurant, but now it's so-and-so's restaurant. The name is like so big and it's, and the celebrity cooking shows have feel, you know, fielded yeah. it as well is I know we had somebody in town that was on one of those shows and won. And then all of a sudden, like, oh, we have to go there because he won on whatever show it was. Yeah. And it's like, oh, so we can make things with weird ingredients. <laughs> like, <you know>? Exactly. <laughs> I really want to go there where they can make, make things with lizards and whatever, you know. And the other thing is the chefs move around all the time as well. And I remember that from Anthony Bourdain's book because they would pick up people and they take them to one restaurant. They take them with them to another restaurant. And the line chefs and everybody moves at the top. And along with it is this very gossipy business that people mm -hmm. do not really realize is that gossipy. And they bring the knowledge of where they work both good and bad. So he has got people coming in and out. And if somebody feels they're slighted in any way or something yep. has happened to them, yep. it's a grudge that gets yep. carried and it's all over town quickly. And is the restaurant something like that part of it interesting to you too? Because I found when I was reading Bourdain, I was like, whoa, this is like crazy what people do. Yeah, it is. And you know, it's really, it's an intense job too. So the tensions are high. People are screaming. There's, you know, you, you've got to get the food out all on time in just the right way. It's, it's super intense. And the people who, you know, the, the, maybe not your, your top, top staff, but I, I say this in the book too, what I found and what I know from, from our friend, Kevin, like they, they bounce around from place to place. Who's, where do you earn the most hits? That's where everybody wants to work. And they're talking, they all have stories to tell. And yeah, so there's a lot of gossip and a lot of moving around. And um, that definitely doesn't help or hurt or doesn't help when you've got something, you know, some financial issues going on at one or more of your places. Yeah. So as you're writing with your outline, your, your draft, and you've got like everything outlined, do you stick pretty much to it or do you go off the, do you go off the, the, off the range a little bit? <laughs> I almost always stick to it. I mean, things, you know, when you're writing, they'll shake out a little differently than what you think, or maybe you need to add a chapter or move some stuff around, but really um, my outlines stick pretty true to the finished mm -hmm. product, except for the book that I am working on now. It's uh, out probably next year, I'm guessing. But um, that one, I, I actually changed some things around in the ending. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, other than that, they, they pretty much stick the same. And that's because by the time I start writing, I've already had, you know, not just my eyes on the outline, but my editors, my agents everybody's kind of put their two cents in and, and we've gotten it to, you know, the strongest um, outline it can be. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, you know, when you're writing, things can change and people do surprising things sometimes <laughs> um, that you don't really expect. So uh, I always give myself room, but um, try to stick to what I got to. Well, you know, it's, it's great that you're doing that up front because so many times the book gets turned in and the editor goes, whoa, whoa, this isn't what I wanted. And this way, at least they know what they're going to get. They may yep. get more, but, you know, at the same time, but you're also taking on some social issues here. You're taking on, we're not going to go into deep dip, but it's like healthcare. You're taking on really what it's like to be in a business where it's cash driven, but like really like the, the people on the line, it's if the restaurant doesn't do well, then you don't do well. And it's that kind of residual thing that I don't think people really think about until this past year, when all of a sudden everybody was unemployed and they started to think of who goes into a restaurant that not just the people up front, everybody in the back, the dishwasher and what this meant to all these people. Right. And it was, you know, everybody's getting loans and blah, blah, blah. And it was really to keep afloat. It was really to keep on going. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And the, book and like was the social, the social issues, you know, that was also something that, um, when I, when I sat down to write and when I came up with Sebastian, I knew I wanted to give him, I mean, he's doing this horrible, awful thing, right? He's coming into this home. He's bringing a gun into a home, holding a woman and her two small children 
for ransom, but he also has some really, in his mind, valid reasons for doing it. And he's kind of backed into the proverbial corner. And so I really wanted to present that in a way that, you know, the reader might not um, agree with how he's going about getting what he wants and needs, but at least they hopefully understand why he's doing what he's doing. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, there's sympathy that comes in because all of a sudden you're realizing it's not just for the sake of money. And right. that odd numbers make you realize that it's not just for the sake of money. It's like, right. what's going on? Right. So you turned it in um, and you stuck pretty much to your outline. So editing from there, what's that like? Do they, I mean, I have um, Linwood Barclay and I quote him a lot says that waiting for the editor's comments is sort of somewhere akin to waiting for tests from the doctor. Am I going <laughs> to live or am I going to die? <laughs> you know? It is true. It is true. Um, and I just got literally today, this morning, got my editor's my editor's letter for the book that I'm working on now. So yeah, it is kind of, it's like, you see that pop in your inbox and you're like, open. <laughs> Maybe not today. Maybe I'll go to the gym first. <laughs> Maybe I'll make lunch. <laughs> Do I need alcohol to read this or not? I don't know. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it's always uh, interesting, but um, I usually go through at least one, sometimes two or three rounds with my agent. She's my first reader and she's got a really good eye. She's, you know, been involved with the whole outline process. So it's not a surprise to her either what the story is about. And she's really good at saying, you know, you know, giving me, giving me tips and ways to make it stronger so that when I turn it into my editor, it's typically a much stronger book. Mm -hmm. um, we don't always have time for tons of that uh, back and forth, but if we can get in one or two rounds, I'm always in a much more confident place when I actually turn it into my editor, uh, which makes me feel much better. Um, but I'm trying to think back to the edits on this particular story. Um, I don't, I don't remember any humongous things. Um, I might have added a little bit more of the interview chapters, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and I'm I, I'm sure if I went back and pulled up that editor's letter, I'd be like, oh, yes, <laughs> I remember that. But I've blocked it out. It was so long ago, I blocked it out. <laughs> but he's right. Linwood is right. It is a very scary, you know, sometimes month, month and a half while you wait for that letter. When it comes, you look at how many pages it is. Oh, it's a whole page. Oh, it's six. Oh, it's two. You know? Exactly. Yes. Yes. Well, the one I got today is four. I don't know if that's good or bad. They're typically around that. And then the whole document is, you know, filled with comments as well. So, right. You go through and you look at those and say, hmm, okay. So you split your time between Atlanta and Amsterdam. So tell me what's in Amsterdam. I know it's in Atlanta because my sister lives in the northern of Atlanta and Alpharetta, but what's in Amsterdam? So my husband is Dutch and um, yeah, his whole family's there. We used to live there when the kids were little. Mo both my kids were actually born there. Uh -huh. um, and we lived there until my oldest was nine. So, you know, his whole family is there and now my oldest is back. He lives there too. So um, I'm over there as much as, as much as I can. My husband has an office there and an office here and I can work anywhere. Right. So it's ideal. We just bounce back and forth as much as we possibly can. Yeah. It's like in writing, going over the ocean <laughs> is the best because there's no Wi-Fi. It's like, oh, this is really good. I can just work. Nobody's going to find me. Exactly. It's actually really good. I get a lot done there because there are fewer distractions. Right, right. And the time difference makes a big difference as well, because you know, New York checks out at a certain point or, you know, this is, and now I can just go on and I don't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah. Exactly. It, their start of the day is going to be later. So I've got some real time to myself. Yeah. It makes yeah. a big difference. Uh -huh. Do you write differently in each place or do you always set up the same way, sit down in morning, afternoon? I'm a morning writer. So um, yeah, I get up and I'm great thing about working at home you know you just pull on some clothes brush your teeth and you're ready for the day <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so yeah so I typically am behind my computer by eight and I spend you know half an hour to an hour just kind of emails social media all the things that I missed um the night before and then and then I get started and I do my best writing in the morning up until like two-ish three-ish okay. sometimes and then I kind of my brain just peters out um, 
and then I go back to, you know, all the other things that you have to do, the social media and the marketing. Yeah. And it's made such a big difference because when we first started this business, none of that existed. We started 20, almost 26 years ago with one site on AOL and we had chat and message boards and we used to type for the authors. In fact, Last week, Brad Meltzer had a book come out and he's always said, you've been there right from the beginning. And I found the interview from 1995 That's where right. we would type for the, because there was no, there was no broadband, there was nothing. And you think about how much it's changed now of you being able to communicate with readers on an ongoing basis before, I mean, when this first started, the one of the reasons we did it was there was no way to know anything about an author. It was right. the back of the book. She lives in Amsterdam and Atlanta. She has two children her husband and a dog. Like, you know, that, that's all you knew. Right. And now, you know what the person had for breakfast, what they had for lunch and <laughs> who their other friends are, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And it's just, it just exploded into this very different thing of knowing your favorite author. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, I, I love it. It's a love, hate. I think every author has a love, hate relationship yeah. with the social media, because like you said, it's, it's a great way to talk with readers. And I've met some amazing people through social media. And um, at the same time, it's also a time suck. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, when I'm, especially when I'm writing a book, when I'm in the midst of writing a draft or doing my editing or whatever revisions, you know, it really takes my attention away from mm-hmm. the work that I need to be doing. Um, but in order for social media to be um, successful, you have to be consistent. So you have to work that in. And um, it's a million different hats even though you don't always feel, you know, like you have the time or the energy. Well, the interesting thing too, is because a lot of times people were writers because they were not very outgoing. They were recluses or whatever. And now it almost demands that you become this public personality and that you have an exciting life and that you read voraciously and you're always ready to talk about your next book or whatever. Whereas before it was a much more private experience of what you would you okay you'd go on the road when the book came out for a couple of weeks you'd go to some stores and then it was whatever like you know typed interviews there were places and that was it that yeah. was all that was going on and now what did you have for breakfast am yeah, i gonna you find know, it's 24 7 putting yourself out there yeah yeah just very 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 different um this, this is your seventh book the process has always been the same the outline real strong outline and from there um, I think with my first couple of books, I probably didn't do as, as, as a detailed of an outline. I was probably a little bit more, I mean, they talk about plotter or pants or right. And I've always been a plotter, but I probably didn't have all my plot points in those first two outlines. I probably just had like the big, um, you know, plot twists. Big touch um, moments. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I also realized that my brain works the best when I have a roadmap and I it can write faster and maybe not write myself into so many corners. Um, so I, you know, as frustrating as it is for me, because that's the part that I like the least of the whole mm-hmm. thing. I love writing and, you know, discovering who my characters are and working through, you know, with words and playing with words. I love all that part. I hate the plotting part. The plotting part to me is like, oh, such a chore. But once I have that outline, I can just like fly through it. Yeah. And it's like, okay, I'm going to sit down. I can do pages one through five of the outline or one through three today, one through two today. I know what I'm going to do. I know where the exciting part's going to be, but I can stop because I know where I'm going to go tomorrow. Exactly. And I, when I sit down the next day to write, I know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. So right. I don't have to sit there and first think, okay, what happens now? You know. <laughs> and what happens now often gets you painted into a corner because the now thing is really great. If if a knife comes out of the drawer at one point, then you've got to get what happens to that knife. Yes. And it may not really work. It may right. not really work if it's not all thought through of what was going to happen. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And you know, I um the kind of stories that I write, I think anybody who writes suspense, mystery, you know, thrillers, they have a lot of moving parts. And so you lay the groundwork for something in chapter three that doesn't come back until chapter what, 17 sometimes, but Mm -hmm. you know, it's, so you have to remember all these things. And the only way I can do that is when I have it on paper or on my computer screen, because in my brain, I know lots of authors though, who can just do it? And I'm like, they must be the rain man because I can't keep track of all that without, you know, will there be, solid, solid outline. 
there are people that have been paying themselves into a corner when they'll sit there and talk sure. about it really because it's yeah. like oh wait and then i had to go rip out pages 75 to you know 125 it just didn't work and i had a character so painful. yeah i remember one time i was reading somebody giving their manuscript and they said okay carol you can read this and i said the little boy was in the hospital room at one point right and they go yeah i said he's still there <laughs> and turn, i go and it's a character they completely written out of the book but he was like in this spot and i'm like wait a second, this is the first time I've seen him, <laughs> you know, he's still there. I remember that line. It was great. Yeah, it's easy what, to do if you don't, if you don't write it down or if you don't, you know. Keep track, keep track. So how much do you read? Do you read psychological thrillers exclusively or what do you read? Everything, anything? I read all over the board. I love, um, I love a good romance. I love, you know, straight up fiction, women's fiction. Um, but I do read a lot in my genre, just um, because that's the kind of stuff I love. Um, I also want to know what's out there and where the market is going. And um, yeah, so I, I, I read a ton, actually. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I mean, I guess every author does. But I think to do that too, like to know the relationship between them, to know the tension between them and whatever, you have to actually see how people talk about things because writing on the page is very different than telling a story. Like you have to there are different ways that you have to bring it all in. And I think the more reading, I mean, when people are saying, like, I want to be a writer, I said, how much do you read? Because if you don't read, you're not going to have. And we think also about how the genres change through the years of what you, is acceptable to write about now that wasn't acceptable before, wasn't a part of the conversation. Right. That's a right. big difference too. Yeah. And there are so many, you know, I mean, so many people coming up with stories that just like blow me away and they take the genre in a different direction. And then so you have to, you know, if you're going to write in that genre, I think you have to read in that genre extensively mm -hmm. because you want to know what's happening and where the market is and what people are really, what's speaking to readers and what they're, what they're, you know, loving. Um, and it's, it, you know, for a long time, all the comps were to girl on a train or the comps would be to X, Y, Z. And I'm seeing less and less of that happening these days yeah. because people are more apt to want to write unique stories and not want to be pigeonholed of it's like this. Yes. And a lot of what you're talking about here is the inside of a marriage, like we're inside these people's marriage. And that is like, oh, well, what other books have done that? And how have they done that? And how have they accomplished it? And it's, it's always different the way it comes out in a storyline, though. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, maybe that's why I'm pulled to romance mm -hmm. and um, women's fiction, because I really, you know, I write these stories about, you know, suspenseful, horrible, awful things that happen um, to a family or to a couple, but really it's about what does this do to their relationships, right? Because that for me is the real heart of the story. Like what's going to happen? Cam has lied about their financial situation. Um, she's, you know, been through this horrible, awful thing. Like, can they, where's the line? At what point do you say here, I, this is where I cannot forgive you. Um, and that's kind of something I, I look at in all my stories. And sometimes, you know, the stories cross the line and they can't come back from it. And sometimes they can. It just it just depends. And I think it's often a, a line that moves depending on the circumstances as well. Mm -hmm. I also love the last lines of the book. Like there's three questions and like, I'm not going to answer. He just gets up. I mean, it's, it's a great end. It's just. Oh, good. Well, thank you. Because we went back and forth. You're talking about in the cam. Yes. Um, in the review chapter. Yes. 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 We went back and forth and back and forth with that. And uh, yeah, so I'm glad. No, no, no. I was, it was just this perfect ending, you know, it was just, uh, and don't read that first, anybody don't, but it's a really great, don't it's a good it wrap. No. It's a really good wrap at the box, you know? Yeah. So was the title always my darling husband? Like, do you title your books? No, this is my editor. She's brilliant at titles. I turn in my books as this was turned in as book number seven. Okay. <laughs> because I have, I used to spend a lot of time thinking about my titles and none of them like took. So I am now like, okay, well, apparently I suck at titles. So why don't you guys tell me what to call it? And you know, they my every publisher has like a whole department of people who are, like you said, looking at comps, they're thinking about, you know, where the market is going. They're the cover too, the cover design. Yeah. Like, they're, they're doing nothing other than thinking about how this is going to look in a bookstore on a mm -hmm. show. And so I feel like they're the experts when it comes to titles and covers. So I just let them do their thing. I just like the coloring. I like, you know, everything about, because 
it's like, what is happening? My darling husband, I'm standing behind him and you know, da, da, da. it's just, it's just totally works. Totally works. So what about the audiobook? Do you have, there's a three person cast doing the audiobook. I haven't had a chance to give it a listen. Did you help them figure out who was going to be the narrators on that? So I usually get a list of like maybe three people per, uh, character point of view and um and I give my suggestion like this is the one I like best for Cam this is the one I like best for you know Sebastian and Jade and um I can't remember if I got my first choices but I typically you know typically do so it can work out it can work yeah. out are you an audiobook great. list yeah do you listen to audiobooks is that something you do I love like audiobooks I listen to mine just for a hot second but it's so weird to listen to I, I I've never made it all the way through one of my own audiobooks just because it's just too strange for me. I don't know mm -hmm. why, but I do love audiobooks. Um, it's, it's interesting because a while ago we were asking authors if they read their books aloud because audio has become so big because a lot of times people will say, whoa, I just said that word like five times on this page. And you don't realize unless you're reading the book aloud. And we were asking people a couple of years ago, do you read your book aloud? And they were like, oh, I couldn't do that. And people were saying they could never narrate their audio book because they just make up new words because that would be a better word there. Right, exactly. <laughs> like, let's change this. No, I actually, um, I have, I write on a Mac. And so I have the, what is it called? Text to speech or whatever. Mm -hmm. And when I'm done with a chapter, I'll usually put that on and just kind of close my eyes and listen to it. And you do hear like, if you have two us and there are two thes or whatever, you know, you, you get all those little things, but it also kind of gives you an idea of what it's, I mean, it, it, it's just very different than actually reading the letters on the screen. And mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, for me, it's, it's a good little editing trick. I think that the Apple people should do something that would be helpful to authors because a lot write on a Mac that when they do that, it'll go, duh the so they it's like you did it again okay? so i think that really if apple really wants to do something to help authors they'll just do that repeat thing in something that really screams it out to you so in case you missed it just want you to know yeah like you wrote just 27 times in this chapter did you take some out i think that really with all the money that Apple's got at this point, I mean, can't they just do that? I mean, considering that they know everything that people want to buy and people want to do, like, let's, let's, you know, let, let's help the authors out too, you know? So then you've been hosting a show with Heather Goodenkoff and Kyra Ruda. I've caught a couple of episodes of this. I love it. Well, thank you. It's like a killer Kelly, killer Kara and killer Heather. I just love this because their names come up like this. So how did you come up with this? I talked to Heather way when you were beginning. So it's still going on. What are you doing with the show? It is. So it's every two weeks. We have our next episode tomorrow night. It, they're always at 9 p.m. Except for if we have someone from a really funky time zone. We have Jilly McMillan next episode. And so we've moved it, I think, to the afternoon. But um, it was actually Kara's idea. I cannot take credit for it. She's brilliant. And we had books coming out around the same time. And so Kara was like, let's do, let's do, you know, some fun virtual thing together and so we just kind of took it from there and heather had a book coming out around the same time and we knew heather from conferences and from you know just to knowing her um for years and it's just a great fun combination so the first three episodes you know we talked about our particular books um and now we're bringing in uh guest authors, killer, killer authors, killer authors. Killer author club. So tomorrow night is a May Cobb. She has a book coming out, I think in May, my summer darlings. And then Jilly McMillan, like I said, we have uh, Jennifer Hilliers coming on later this year. I I'd have to look at the list, but we're booked all the way through summer already. I love it. I love it. Jilly's I'm reading Jilly's book right now and I am loving this book and you're just watching the voices going back and forth. It's just really fun. And it is fun. Like you said, when you're reading a lot in the genre, because then you're sitting there going, wait, how does this one do with it? And wow, these two are both creepy in different ways. And yeah, it's been really, really fun. So what's next for you? What's next uh -huh. for your, what did you turn, what have you turned in that you've got these notes on? <laughs> <laughs> it is a book called The Personal Assistant. It is about an Instagram influencer, a woman who, um, you know, has crazy amount of followers and posts something um, that hits, that lands all wrong. And it goes viral in a very bad way. And um, she's getting canceled 
um, online, but also, you know, seems like someone might be trying to cancel her in person as well, or personally in real life. And um, in the midst of all this, her personal assistant goes like vanishes and it looks like she may have had something to do with this post and may have, um, you know, something to do with um, all the things that are happening to my main character, the influencer. Interesting because the influencers right now, it is crazy. They'll sit there and say, there's a million people following this person. I'm like, really? There are a million people following this person doing whatever. Um, and I have to tell you, there are times when I watch videos on TikTok or whatever, and I'm just there like, okay, so first of all, somebody made this, they edited it and they put this up. And like, how many people have sat, watched this all day long? These are like television numbers of yeah. people that are sitting and watching. And it's, it's just exploded. And it's very interesting to watch. It's yeah. not, it used to be the Kardashians and it used to be just the, like, we used to say the Kardashian numbers or whatever, but now it's like everyday people are posting yeah. those kinds of numbers. Yes, yes. And, you know, I think especially in the beginning, there were a lot of, or maybe some accidental, you know, people who accidentally got so huge and big. But, you know, from my research and what I was, the people I was talking to and researching this book, I mean, they, they, it is like a, a real business. They yes. are making money. They are super intentional about everything that they post. Um, they've seen like the whole cancel culture stuff. They're all terrified of it. One wrong word um, can really, you know, balloon into this huge thing. So um, I kind of, I kind of took all that and ran with it for this story. It well, was a lot of fun. There's this, um, there's a young girl. There's also a problem with young people with all of a sudden they have stalkers. Mm-hmm. And this one girl was super popular. I mean, her family was living off of what she was making. Yeah. And there's this stalker coming that like really wants to kill her and they have to go into hiding and all this kind of stuff. And you're, wow, this is like really out of control at this point. And especially for a lot of teens or young people that are just putting stuff out there and not realizing what's going on. And you hear about very young children doing, like I'm making a video, I'm doing this, that, the other thing. And filmmaking has become way too easy, way too easy to do. But it's scary to see because your whole life is out there then. Putting yourself out there and not just yourself, but your whole family. You know, this the influencer in my story, she's married. She's got two twin girls and they're 12. So, you know, at this really vulnerable age, they're coming into, you know, starting to look like miniature women. And, you know, when she started, they were cute little kids, but now all of a sudden they're, you know, almost teenagers and their whole life is out there. And mm-hmm. it, 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 it makes you vulnerable in a way that you maybe don't, realize going in um but yeah it's it's kind of scary has it made you more cautious about what you post and what you do like just thinking about it more because or are you always careful i've always been careful although i will you know my kids are bigger too they're uh 23 and 27 almost 28 so you know they run their own social media now my Mm -hmm. my daughter actually works for um a couple of they're podcasters but I guess you could say they're also influencers they have a huge amount of following and so you know she she definitely sees what goes on in their dms crazy people who you know I mean they're you definitely open your life up for a lot of um I don't want to say danger it could be danger but you know I mean you just don't have control over what people are saying about you what they're what they know about you um Mm -hmm. you know it's really easy to find people online so you know I think when um when my kids were younger and I would I would always put them on my social media but there there comes a point and there came a point where it was like, okay, this could be dangerous. Like this mm-hmm. could be, this could go wrong, you know? Mm-hmm. So you definitely think about that. And I think and I they know- think about it differently too. I think they think about it differently because they've always had it. And yeah. I know that, you know, mine can walk away from it in like two minutes. Like I, it, I don't need my whole life out there. I need to be talking about everything. And I think that it's, it goes in like waves. I mean, it's like at the beginning, why was AOL big? Because kids were on AOL. Then what do they do? They went to Earthlink. Then what do they do? They went to Facebook. When he, uh, well, okay, Facebook, then the parents went, then they went to Instagram. Then they went to TikTok. Then they went, and it's really, they're setting the tone for where you go, yeah. but then how much do they embrace it once they're there? Do they still want to do that all the time? Right, right, exactly. 
yeah, the story, the story of my life in pictures. Now let's just go back. You know, every once in a while though, those pictures pop up and I'm like, oh my God, I remember that picture. Yeah, we did go do that, didn't we? Because sometimes I really don't remember. I, I tell you, people say to me, why do you photograph Christmas and put it up? And I said, you have no idea how many times I flip back and I go, oh, that's how I set the table. Where's that thing? Because you just don't remember. So I said, I use social media as like my own little like bank of going back and figuring out what I did. You know, I love it. It's that. And when I go to the garden center, I pull up the pictures from last year. I'm like, do you have this flower? Like this one, like, where is this flower? And it's like, and I'm just scrolling back. I'm like, oh, I didn't do it last year. I did the year before. And I'm just, and they're looking at you like a lunatic standing there, but it's like, I'm not going to remember everything I planted where, but I remember it was really pretty. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And Facebook is good about that too, right? This day, however many years ago. Yes. Um, they'll show you the reminders yeah yeah the reminders what happened yeah so it's really fun this has been such fun talking to you i look forward to your next book this did have me terrified at moments and then oh cam what have you done you know so i love it well thank you thank you so much for joining us I really appreciate your time thank you for having me and to our readers look forward to seeing you next time on book reporter talks to and remember you can go out and subscribe on youtube so that you never miss an episode or do the same thing wherever you listen to podcasts. It's Book Reporter Talks to. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.